Hi, my name is Derek Barton, and I am here today because I, I'm going to give you a quick introduction to how to write test questions. So let's get started. So first off, why do we need to test? Why do we need to be able to write test questions? Um, for our purposes, um, exam items can serve as a gateway to certification and other credentialing. Uh, can serve a uh, purpose of self-assessment for knowledge gaps. So for example, our advanced knowledge assessment uh, lets uh, examinees identify areas of weakness. Uh, it can also chart examinee progress. So the MCAP exam, for example, um, lets uh, critical care fellows see where their, uh, their knowledge is, is uh, strong and where they need to fill in gaps. Um, you can also use testing to assess the effectiveness of educational programs. Um, so how are we doing and how uh, are we helping um, our members meet their educational goals? And of course, because the boards make us. So whether it's for a, a board certification exam or maintenance of certification assessment is here to stay um, in terms of uh, how we qualify and maintain our um, board status. So why do you need a training for this? Uh, if you have the subject area knowledge, uh, why not just jump right in? Um, well, because writing good test questions is, is as much art as science. Um, there um, are certain basic principles that if you understand them, uh, will allow you to write high quality items that uh, will function well on exams, but if you um, are not avoiding basic flaws, the uh, usability of items uh, can be next to nil, regardless of how sound the content is. Um, so this is a, a, a really good uh, quote that I like from uh, the NBME's guide on writing test questions. Um, we need to be trained in order to avoid flaws that benefit the test-wise examinee and avoiding irrelevant difficulty. Uh, these are prerequisites that must be met in order for test questions to generate valid scores. Uh, so I'm going to talk about each of these uh, separately, um, test-wiseness and irrelevant difficulty. So first, we're going to focus mostly on irrelevant difficulty. Um, so creating questions that test knowledge and don't uh, distract from uh, what they're, they're focused on. Uh, so this is an example of what a good test question looks like from a very uh, superficial perspective. So most of our questions are going to um, involve some sort of a, a clinical vignette and uh, four to five answer choices. So this is uh, what we refer to as a single best answer multiple choice question. Um, so the way a good question looks is typically heavy on the top. So the stem and the lead in are the longest part of the question, you know, paragraph form. Um, and then the answer choices are usually short and, you know, a single word, maybe a sentence, and of all about the same length. Um, so if you get down into the answer choices and you start getting, you know, little paragraphs in each choice, there may be uh, a question of irrelevant difficulty being introduced into that question because then what you uh, have is a situation where a respondent has to dig through answer choices to look for the right answer. Um, so a good question should have a clinically relevant focused applied STEM. So we're testing... Um, we're testing clinical application rather than just kind of uh, rote knowledge or recall. Um, a clinical vignette based in a case that one might see in actual practice. Uh, the lead-in is the sentence that ends with the question, uh, the question mark. And then four to five short, plausible, and parallel answer choices. Uh, and in um, testing lingo, the key is the correct answer, and then incorrect answers are referred to as distractors. And then for um, most of our tests uh, at SCCM, we also want to have a rationale. 
Um, so the rationale is, uh, you know, several paragraphs that explain why the right answer is right uh, and also why the wrong answers are wrong and then provide some background or context. Uh, so a few paragraphs is usually plenty for a rationale. Uh, and then at least one reference, uh, preferably two or three. Um, and that is what a good question will look like. And here's an example. Um, so this question has, as you can see, a clinical vignette. So a three-year-old female is brought to the emergency department, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you get vital signs here. And then you get lead-in, which the following structures is likely injured most severely. Okay, and you'll notice that lead-in is very focused. So they're not saying, you know, hey, which of these answers is right? You know, they're asking you to pick out a specific thing, so a structure. And they're asking you to identify which one is most likely to be the most severely injured. And then if you look at the answer choices, they're all roughly the same length, and they're all also the same sort of choice. They're all uh, parts of the brain. So you're, you're given five uh, parallel, uh, plausible answer choices to choose from. Then you have some uh, more parts of the question, so the rationale again. Some of our questions are keyed to um, board content outlines. So this one, for example, is uh, keyed to ABP content. Um, sometimes you'll see keywords, uh, and then here's references for that question. So that's an actual example of a question that is used on one of our exams. So what a poor question looks like. Uh, a poor question will have a short stem with an unfocused lead-in. A great example of an unfocused lead-in is, hey, which of these is right? Um, we see that, unfortunately, fairly often. Uh, and that, that typically means that uh, the question will need some revision. Um, and then you have a lot of content in the answer choices rather than vice versa. Uh, so long, heterogeneous answer choices. So if you see a question that is very skimpy on the stem and there's a lot of content in the answer choices, chances are it might need revising. Um, it's always a good rule of thumb if the answer choices are where most of the content is. And why that is, is it, it makes the um, question unnecessarily difficult um, so that you're not really testing whether examinees know the content, you're more testing of like, okay, who can dig through a bunch of stuff that's irrelevant and spot the right thing. Okay, so to sum up some of these, uh, these concepts, so for this question, which of the following is true about pseudo-gout? Okay, so this is what we call a which of the following type question, W-O-T-F. Um, now just because it says which of the following in an item doesn't mean there's an issue, um, but if it says which of the following is true, that usually indicates an issue because you're not asking for a specific um, answer. You're, you're basically creating a single multiple choice question that more or less functions as five true-false questions, and that's not really a valid approach to it creating a good multiple choice question. Um, another issue with this one, vague language. So if you look at the answer choices, it occurs frequently in women. Well, how often is frequently? Is that one in 10, one in a thousand? Um, no, you know, there's no standard definition for how often that is. Seldom, most. Um, so vague language also introduces uh, irrelevant difficulty and uncertainty in, in questions. Uh, then non-parallel answer choices. So you'll see choice C being a lot longer than A, B, D, or E. Um, so that's also an issue. We'll talk more about why uh, in a minute. And then the other issue is that this tests recall um, rather than application. So you're, you're not really faced with a decision-making uh, task here. It's more of just like, do you know this sort of uh, bit of medical trivia? Um, typically not what we want to see in, in question writing. OK, now here is another. Um, example if you were to write a question on a similar topic. So a 78-year-old woman 
presents in the ER with acute painful swelling of the right knee. CBC shows elevated white blood cells. Radiography reveals calcified masses in the joint capsule. Arthrocentesis shows rhombus-shaped crystals and synovial fluid under polarized light microscopy. You have a pretty picture. We like pictures. Uh, what is the most likely diagnosis? And, oops. Um, and where did that go? Co uh, chondrocalcinosis, um, which is, I think, the fancy term for pseudogout. Okay, so obviously a much better item if more content in the stem, uh, focused answer choices, uh, rather than long choices that you have to dig through and lots of vague language. Okay. Uh, again, another example of a question where there's lots of content in the answer choices. This is also um, something we refer to as a waiting room question. Um, so what you see here is um, the STEM is asking you which of these patients is a better candidate for uh, thrombolytic therapy. And then you have, you know, five different patients with different uh, conditions and you're asked to check uh, to, to choose which one would be the patient that you would give uh, thrombolytic therapy to. The problem with this is not only um, do you have to go digging through answer choices and it's not clear from the stem what the correct answer might be, um, but also it doesn't really um, approximate what we'd run into in uh, clinical practice. Like, I don't know of any condition where uh, you would have, you know, uh, a thrombolytic therapy just kind of sitting around, um, you know, some tissue plasminogen activator, and you're like, oh, I'm going to use this on somebody. Let me find which of these five people that's in my waiting room I'm going to give, you know, this TPA. Um, that's not really the way it works. Now, if, if this were a um, uh, sort of an administration question where you're being asked to triage patients, that would make a little more sense, but this is not that sort of question. Okay, so some basic do's and don'ts about um, creating the question system. So do focus on important clinical concepts, so typically common or catastrophic problems. Uh, don't ask questions about minutia, esoteric, or trivia. So we don't, we don't want the like, you know, sort of, oh, isn't that cool, um, this thing I, you know, read about the other day type questions. You know, we, we want things that are relevant uh, in, practic in practice. Um, do require the examining to apply and synthesize knowledge rather than focusing on uh, mere knowledge recall. Um, do provide lab results and other findings. And I say here may be extraneous because um, there is a question about, you know, do, do you include information in, this, in the vignette that you might not need to answer the question? Yes, that's fine. Some, some window dressing is fine. You know, not everyone agrees on, on that point. Um, but we are trying to um, simulate scenarios that you would run into in practice. And so, you know, you, there, there can be some extra, um, extra findings in there if you want to include them. But do not use them to try to trick the examinee. So we're not really looking for trick questions. We're just um, looking for questions that uh, really test a, an important concept. Uh, include pictures or video. We are um, starting to um, support video soon, so we're interested in items that might include video. Uh, don't please don't use the second person. Um, writers love to do this. It's it's not good um, uh, style. Um, so using you um, rather than you know referring to patients or um, physicians in the third person, you know it's, it's not a which way book. Um, so we we avoid that uh, that stylistic approach. Okay, um, so how to focus items? So this is taken from it's um, known in educational circles as Bloom's taxonomy. Um, of knowledge. Um, so on the kind of the lower end of the scale is just your pure recall question. So, you know, do you remember this bit of information from medical school? Um, 
then higher uh, up on the scale or higher up on the taxonomy would be synthesis. So, you know, being able to put information together to arrive at a solution. Um, but even better are questions that focus on judgment. Um, so here's this complex situation, and we're requiring you not only to deduce certain um, facts from other facts, but also to make a judgment call about what's the best um, next step. You know, so given this presentation, what are you going to do? Um, so those are uh, typically better quality items that, that test more of the objectives that we're looking for. Uh, so, for example, a recall question would be one that asks, you know, which of the following uh, symptoms or findings is typical of a certain disease process? A synthesis question would be asking you, you know, here's this patient, what's the diagnosis? Uh, a judgment question would go one step farther and then ask you to pick what are you going to do? Okay, so what's the most appropriate next step in management? Um, but without saying you. <laughs> um, Okay, uh, another example of that, um, so testing application versus testing recall. So how is St. Louis encephalitis transmitted? So we like this better. So a 62-year-old man has just returned from a fishing trip to Alabama, okay, and you get all of his symptoms, and you're being asked to come up with a diagnosis of St. Louis encephalitis based on that, rather than just recall how it's transmitted. Okay, another example, acute intermittent porphyria is the result of a defect in the biosympathetic pathway for heme. Or, and then you get the vignette, and you're asked to not, in this case, make a diagnosis, but to go one step beyond that. So you need the diagnosis, but you also need to know the bit of information about that it's related to heme. So that's yet another step uh, in your in reasoning that's being asked for. So that's good. It requires, you know, um, uh, knowledge at, at multiple levels. Okay, so a few points about the lead-in, um, again, which is the sentence that ends in the question mark. So do ask for a specific type of answer, okay? So rather than which of the following is true, we're asking for, you know, which of the following diagnoses would be correct, or which of the following treatment options uh, would be the best choice, etc. Okay, um, and then do ask for a question that can be answered without looking at the choices. So this is a really important concept, and if you take away nothing else from uh, from this, uh, it would be this: that a good multiple choice question, you should be able to cover up the answer choices, and if you, if you know enough, you should be able to answer it without looking at any of the choices. So that's a good way to test your, your own question writing, um, is if you can answer the question without referring to the answer choices. Uh, okay, and a good lead-in does not just ask which of the following is right. Okay. Um, also, we avoid uh, questions that ask the examinee to come up with wrong answers. So, which are the all of the following except, um, you know, blank um, is a type of you know uh, neoplasm, for example. Um, because what we what we don't want we don't want uh, examinees focusing on incorrect information. Um, because studies have shown that they actually will tend to recall that uh, in preference to correct information. So we're, we're not wanting to ask examinees to look for wrong answers, so we avoid accept type questions. Okay, and then I threw in a whole slide for this because this is really important. Um, so you should be able to answer the question without looking at the choices. So very important. Hopefully you will take that away from this, if nothing else. Here's an example of that for any nutritionists uh, that might be out there. So a 23-year-old woman admitted to the ICU. She has a history of regional enteritis with multiple bowel fistulae, sedated and intubated, mechanically ventilated uh, in, uh, due to respiratory failure. In planning for nutritional support, which method best estimates her caloric needs? 
And if you know your stuff, you will know that choice C, indirect colorimetry, um, would be the way to go with her. And you wouldn't even need to look at the answer choices. And I'm not a nutritionist, but I have been told that if you are a nutritionist, you would know this without looking at the answer choices. So I will take their word for that. Uh, here's one that does not pass the test. Amrinone, well, cover up those answer choices. Um, okay, what, what about amrinone? Um, so we don't want to see items like this. All right, some do's and don'ts about the answer choices, otherwise known as the options. So do keep them short and about the same length. Um, do vary location of the key. The key, again, is the right answer. So we don't want to always have the right answer be choice C, for example, or choice B, um, because, well, then that makes it too easy. Um, do make them grammatically consistent with the stem. I'll give you some examples of how that's an issue in just a minute. Um, do keep them all parallel. So all the same type of, of uh, answer, if possible. And, and of course, you can't always do that, but um, if possible. Um, and then do base distractors on common errors. So the more plausible a distractor can be, the better. Because if you throw a distractor in there that no one would ever pick, well, you know, it's, it's not going to really help make it a better quality question. Um, so you know, differential diagnoses or, or common math errors are, are good examples of ways to create uh, plausible distractors. Uh, so for the options, avoid extreme language, so always and never. I'll show you some examples of that in a minute. Also avoid vague language. Um, and then don't uh, give multiple answers in a single choice. So, you know, if at all possible, we want the choices to be one thing. You know, so one drug, one intervention, rather than, okay, well, here's a couple things you'll do or a couple drugs you'll give. You know, if, if at all possible, focus it on a single answer choice. Um, and then we don't use none of the above or all of the above in answer choices um, because it, it, uh, it skews the, the reporting and the statistical analysis to include those. Um, and then um, we avoid overlapping options. I'll show you some of those in a minute also. Um, so on the point of vague determiners, um, the, this study um, polled uh, test question writers to define what percent each of these terms means. So, you know, for example, rarely, well, rarely could be 5%, it could be 12%, often is anywhere from 40 to 70%. Um, so just to kind of drive home the point that these terms and questions introduces uh, vagueness and uh, reduces the question's ability to really tell uh, who knows the content from who doesn't. All right, so returning to our original um, uh, goal here. So what we've been talking about so far has been about irrelevant difficulty, so ways to avoid confusing examinees in ways that don't help you tell whether or not they know the content. Um, so now I want to talk a little bit about test wiseness. Um, so test wiseness, if, if you go, for example, to take one of these test prep courses that these major um, companies offer, they are teaching you test wiseness. It's one of the things they're teaching you. And that is how to outguess, outsmart test writers. So as test writers, you guys need to be smarter than the examinees, so you don't you don't want them to uh, be able to outfox you. Um, so let's look at some ways that uh, we can be smarter than the examinees in terms of uh, how to create test questions that aren't easy to guess. Um, so all distractors should be plausible and consistent with the STEM. So for example. 24-year-old male, has uh, onset of fever, um, progresses to respiratory failure, um, chest x-ray reveals diffuse alveolar and interstitial infiltrates, bronchial alveolar lavage, shows greater than 25% eosinophils, what drug therapy is most appropriate? A, pizza. B, continue mechanical ventilation. C, methylprednisone. 
D Vix Vapo Rub E54. Hmm. I wonder which of these is going to be the right answer. Um, so clearly, choice C is correct. What's wrong with B? Well, B is not a drug therapy. Um, and of course, it's obvious what's wrong with uh, the other ones. Um, but this just shows that you know if we're not paying attention not only to writing a good question, um, but also to writing good distractors that actually make sense, it doesn't matter how good the question is. Everyone's going to get it right. Um, so we really need to, to uh, create distractors that are plausible in addition. Okay, here's a better example. Uh, where all the distractors are drugs and kind of makes sense, not all of them. Um, I wrote this one and I'm not a physician, but I did my best. Um, all right, and then also we want to try to avoid extreme language. So, for example, an eight-year-old girl presents with flooping putsy and blue. This is a bunch of nonsense that I made up. Um, a, always smot the boomba. B, never blit when purple fad. C, check for Nunu. Um, one thing they teach you, and I, I know because I used to teach for Kaplan, is that if you see answer choices that say things like always and never, you should not pick them. Um, and the reason is that that um, narrows down the possibilities that that answer choice would cover. So extreme language in the world of, of the test-wise examinee means probably you're not going to pick that answer choice. Um, so just being aware of, of using that kind of language. All right, another issue to avoid, multiple answers and overlap. So for example, in this question, each answer choice has got two parts. Um, one thing that they'll teach you in these test prep courses is when there's two parts, all you do is you count up the occurrence of each uh, answer across all of the answers. So as you see, hyperkalemia shows up three times, hypoglycemia shows up twice, the rest only show up once. Whichever answer choice has uh, the most um, terms that show up the most often, tends to be the correct answer. And in that case, this is choice B, which is the correct answer here. So we didn't even really need to know anything about the topic to get the correct answer. How many pranks are in a glort? Well, guess what? Three. Um, this is an issue with if we have answer choices that are in sequence, so numerical answer choices, for example, um, the middle choice will tend to be the right answer. So we want to make sure when we're creating questions that we uh, sometimes have the key be, you know, maybe choice A or choice E, not always put it in the middle. The purpose of the clus in from palling is to remove clus prags. So this is what we call a clang association. So when when we hear something in the stem that we then hear again in the correct answer, that can cue a right answer. So you want to avoid that. Tracing is true when lust plurks the vom, the viscal flams if the viscal is domal or zortal, etc, etc. Choice B would be the uh, test-wise choice to pick, because it's the longest. Um, statistically, long answer choices are often right. Um, and this is because they're created by educators, uh, and we like to teach people things. And so we want to give them information. And uh, the right answer choice often has more information in it, because we want them to know. Um, and something you'll often see is, in the clinical questions, you'll see, like, give him such and such a drug due to, you know, his hypotension and whatnot. Um, so, you know, not only is the answer giving you what you need to do, but it's also telling you why you need to do it. L leave off the why. Just give, you know, give this drug, for example, um, and then put the reasoning and the rationale. 
Um, okay, another example. The sigla frequently overfreaks the teslum because all siglas are melius, siglas are always vodial, teslum is usually terius, no tresla are fescible. Again, extreme language. So C would be the best guess here because it doesn't have any extreme language in it. Among the reasons for tristal dos are the sabs foped in the fault sends, the credges eroded with the orats, etc., etc. Well, this one is a case of grammatical consistency. So among the reasons, plural, are choice A is the only answer choice that has more than one reason. Reasons. All right. Which of the following is are always present when trussels are being given? That's a way to, to fix that, by the way, that last issue is slash R, okay, rather than just R. Which of the following is are always present when uh, trussels are being given? Rent and Vost, Vost, Shum and Vost, Vost and Phone. Well, again, count up the occurrences of each individual term. Oh, look, it must be Vost, because Vost is in every single one. Okay. The fribbled breg will mentor best with an, again, grammatical consistency. If it's an, it must be a vowel, igno. And what about this one? The mentoring function of the igno is most effectively carried out in connection with, well, didn't we just see that? The fribbled breg will mentor best with an ignu, right? Same question, just turned around. Okay, so we need to be aware of are we giving away answers in previous questions? All right, so now that we've covered a bit of um, examples of test wiseness and how to avoid giving away right answers, uh, let's spend a little bit of time talking about how to generate new items. So we want to start with a testing point. A testing point is basically like a learning objective or an objective of the, the question. What is the content that we want to assess? Um, and then once we have that objective for the question, it's easier to write a question around the testing point. Uh, so a few uh, suggestions for ways to generate new items. Uh, you can use a template. I'll show you some templates in just a second. Uh, you can use a board content specification. So if you look at the outlines for the board exams uh, and say pick a, a content area to focus on, that's an easy way to get started. Uh, work backwards from a diagnosis or work forwards from a given presentation. Um, and also being sure to think about you know, common things that intensivists would need to be able to do, uh, so things that we want to see if a successful examinee could handle in a clinical situation. Um, and though, you know, we, though we like to think about theory, we want to always keep it focused on practice. These are some examples of template. Uh, template is a structure for an item that we can recreate multiple items out of. Um, so if you look at that first one, a patient description has a type of injury and location, which of the following structures is most likely to be affected? You could generate lots of items just from that template by plugging in different patient descriptions, different injuries and locations of injury, um, and uh, just create multiple items. Um, and there's a lot of these templates are to be found in this NBME uh, publication, which I will um, uh, show you uh, the reference for at the end of this, uh, this slideshow. Okay, so an example of using a template. So a 65-year-old man has difficulty rising from a seated position and straightening his trunk, but he has no difficulty flexing his leg. Which of the following muscles is most likely to have been injured? So that same template we were just looking at, and choice A would be correct. So out of all of these questions that we've been looking at, they all fall into a handful of 
of question categories. Um, and these are some of the, the categories that you'll see over and over again. So, you know, what is the drug that's involved here? What is the toxic exposure? Um, predicting findings, either physical findings, lab findings, um, et cetera. So that's another way to think about generating questions is what type of question do I want to write? Do, do I want the examinee to be coming up with a diagnosis? Do I want them to be deciding on a drug to, uh, to give, um, et cetera? So thinking about the type of answer you're looking for before you even write the STEM. All right. Um, very, very briefly, I just want to touch on item analysis, uh, just in case you might be looking at um, some of the analytics for any of the um, question items. So a few important terms. So performance refers to the relative difficulty of the item. So basically, what percent of respondents got it right? Um, and an easy item would be, say, over 80%. A moderate difficulty item would be like 50% to 80. Difficult items are less than 50% of respondents getting them correct. Um, then also, and probably the most important metric is what's referred to as the discrimination. So the discrimination is, is if you're doing everything that uh, I've covered so far, the point of all that is to create an item that has a high discrimination. Uh, discrimination means does the item test what it claims to test? If an examinee gets the item right, does that mean that they know that content? And does it separate effectively examinees that are high performing from examinees that are low performing? Um, so it's basically an indication of the quality of a test item. So here, here's an example item, uh, which we already saw, the one about uh, indirect calorimetry. Um, and if you look at the bottom, you've got an example item analysis. So you'll see percent high, percent low. What those refer to is the, um, out of the total pool of examinees that took this uh, exam that this question was on, um, the percent of, um, well, the percent high refers to the top 25% of scores, not on this item, but on the exam as a whole. And then percent low refers to the bottom 25%. So um, per, for percent high, for the top 25%, you'll see in this little graph that all of those examinees picked the correct answer, which is choice C. So the, those are the high performers on the exam, and they all got it right. And then you'll see for the low performers, the, the bottom 25% of examinees, 56% of them got it right. Um, while 18% chose A, 18% B, 4% D, 4% E. Now, what that tells you is that um, choice A and choice B are better distractors than choices D and E because they are, are apparently more plausible. Uh, if very few people pick a distractor, it means that that distractor probably isn't a very good distractor and it might need to be rewritten. Um, so the PT here, that's the overall performance of the item. So 78% of examinees got it right. And it has a discrimination of 0.55. Um, anything above about a 0.2 is typically a pretty good item. Um, if you start getting into negative discriminations, you very likely have either a fatally flawed item or an item that has what's called a miskey. Um, a miskey is where, say for this item, you know, it's the same item, but in the exam, um, choice B is marked as the correct answer just because of a transcription error or whatnot. That would be a miskey, that the um, correct answer that's given is actually not the correct answer. So in that case, you would get a negative discrimination, which means that um, more uh, of the high-performing examinees got it wrong than the low-performing examinees. Um, so if there's a negative discrimination, you've really got an issue. Um, so that is my brief overview of 
question item writing and item analysis and some uh, references that might be useful to you if you want to explore further, especially this uh, first reference, the NBME guide, I find to be a very excellent um, guide and, and fairly comprehensive. Um, so that guide covers all of these topics uh, at even greater depth. Um, so thank you for, uh, for listening and uh, wishing you a pleasant day.